Today, we're going to be exploring the top museums in Kuala Lumpur, and I'll let you know why each one of them made it into this list. So let's get started. The National Textiles Museum. Located to the southeast of Merdeka Square, the National Textile Museum brings visitors on a fascinating journey through the diversity of Malaysia's many cultures exemplified by the country's textile industry. This beautiful, gorgeous building behind me is the National Textile Museum. It was built in 1905 to house the Federated Malay Railways. And then in 1917, when they moved away to a different building, it was given to the Public Works Department. In January of 2010, it was turned into the Textiles Museum. In 1983, it was declared one of the historical buildings in Kuala Lumpur, and you can see why. It's a gorgeous building, and it's officially known as the JKR Building 26, in case you want to Google it. Established in 2010, the museum traces the evolution and development of the country's textile industry and how it has shaped the lifestyles of Malaysians from prehistoric times to the present. The National Textile Museum has five main galleries with collections of beautiful textiles, clothing and accessories, as well as information on the nation's textile production techniques. The Pelangi Gallery. The Pelangi Gallery exhibits heritage collections such as different types of batiks and their growth over the years and a collection of garments worn by the Chinese community. Batiks are an Indonesian technique of wax resistant dyeing applied to the whole cloth. This technique originated from the island of Java in Indonesia. A batik is made either by drawing dots and lines of wax with a spattered tool called the canton or by printing the wax with a copper stamp called the cup. Moving upstairs, we find the Ratnasari and the Teluk Perantai galleries. The Ratnasari gallery showcases diamond, gold, silver, and other jewelry items worn by the different ethnic communities in Malaysia. The collection includes chastity belts, buckles, hairpins, pendants, bracelets, anklets, rings, and many other types of jewelry. The Teluk Perantai Gallery showcases the Teluk Perantai style, also known as interlocking bays, which are beautiful motifs made up of individual flower designs stitched together into geometric patterns and are predominant in Malay textile designs. During our visit, the Sandeira Gallery was running the Rasia Kevaya exhibition or the Secret of Kevaya exhibition, showcasing the uniqueness, elegance and diversity of Bahu Kevayas in Malaysia. A Bahu Kevaya is a traditional dress worn by Javanese women. This collection comprises of 60 different kabaya dresses and some of them, in our opinion, were extremely beautiful and colorful. That one. Nineteen eighty six. 
something similar. This beautiful Shorkabaya dress with a modern cut is the official uniform for Malaysia airline flight attendants. The outfits were designed by the fashion design department at the Madat University of Technology and have continued to be worn until today. The Pohon Buri Gallery showcases the origins of textiles from the prehistoric times as well as the tools, the materials and the different techniques of textile making over the ages. Displays here include examples of calendaring and gilding, gold thread embroidery, embroidered shawls, head clothes and tapestries. The Textiles Museum opens every day from 9 to 5 p.m. and tickets cost 5 ringgit per person. Here we see examples of the equipment used in the production of sunkets. Sunkets are the traditional Malaysian hand-woven fabric made by women in the Malay Peninsula. The term sunket refers to the decorative weaving technique used to make the fabric, which entails inserting gold and silver threads in between the base threads. What do you think? What do I think about one? This one. The one that you're looking oh. at. <laughs> it's very cool. The Kuala Lumpur City Gallery. Today we are visiting the gallery in Kuala Lumpur. It's been pouring all day, so we've looked for activities to do indoors, and this came up on our Google search. The first thing you see right in front of the gallery is the I Love KL sign. This is a popular stop for visitors to take pictures before they even enter the gallery. The gallery is found inside the 125 year old former government printing office, one of KL's finest heritage buildings located on Mardeka Square. It's right next to the Music Museum and a five minute walk from the Masjid to make train station. Built in 1898, the Kuala Lumpur City Gallery building is a classic piece of the Indo-Gothic architecture the British favored at the time. The KL City Gallery is only part of a museum. It is also an information center for tourists where you can learn about the history of Kuala Lumpur and Malaysia. The lower level galleries contain photos and maps of all KL with some historical information and miniature models of some of the most well-known buildings. Inside, there's a tourist information counter where visitors can obtain details and maps of where to go and what to see in KL. In here, you can also register for the free Little India Walking Guided Tour. They have these really cool miniature things everywhere. You can't really appreciate them unless you are like literally next to them or looking at them, but they're so small, so cute. We are now on the second room, which is the main, I guess, lot of expositions and there's a bunch of different things uh, you can use for taking pictures with the background behind. I think that the point here is that there are I guess representations or miniatures of all the touristic sites or points around the city so you can come here and take pictures with them. Question is why, didn't, why wouldn't you do it with the real thing and I guess you could do both.
This miniature model of the Sultan Abdul Samad building is designed to show its own reflection, just as if it was built in front of a lake. There are a ton of really cool things to see in Kuala Lumpur. So far, after three months living here, just like the sign outside, we love this city. And if you're new to our channel and want to explore more of this amazing city with us, make sure you subscribe to our channel today. And of course, don't forget to like this video. Now this room is super cool. They have, I guess, a complete replica, miniature replica of the whole of Kuala Lumpur, the city. They play some really cool, dramatic, cinematic music. You can probably hear in the background. It really puts you in, I guess, in a cool, like, I'm in a movie mood. I'm enjoying this room. This impressive model of modern Kuala Lumpur was built at a cost of $1 million and contains more than 5,000 buildings. It's not a huge thing, it's two floors in about five, I guess, rooms of expo expositions. But the biggest thing behind us is the food court, which is some I guess memorabilia that you can buy, but the food looks amazing and smells so good. It's only about three o'clock in the afternoon, so it's not time for eating, but I'm, I'm thinking about, I don't know, forwarding dinner another five hours so I can have it right now because the pastries here look amazing. But we're gonna go explore a little bit and see what this place is all about. Apart from food, on this floor you can find a souvenir store with a lot of cool things from models of the Petronas Towers to key rings and wood carvings. You can also watch as the cooks prepare the different desserts and pastries. They all look delicious. I guess that's pretty much it, the gist of it. So we're now going to head out. It looks like it's raining outside, so I'm gonna try not to get too wet. The best time to visit Kuala Lumpur is from May to July, and then from December to February, when humidity is quite low. But if you find yourself in KL during October, as we did, you'll find that the seasonal monsoon brings daily rains, which happen on and off during the afternoons and the average temperature is over 85 degrees, with the humidity also being quite high. However, to get the best of your trip, even during the rain, you can try different indoor activities like going to a relaxing spa, visiting the aquarium, shopping centers, and even taking some cooking classes to learn the recipes of traditional Malay cuisines. That behind us right there is the gallery here in Kuala Lumpur. And it's really not that big, it's actually rather small. It's about five rooms over two floors. It is interesting, I guess. It's free, so it, it makes it worthwhile. But as we're coming as we're coming out, you can see behind me it's pouring right. down right now. So we're literally hiding <laughs> under this small, small room. Yeah, it's small ledge in trying not to get completely soaked and everyone's doing the same but it is i guess worth visit because it's free but it's kind of cool though finally stopped raining so we decided to go and get some food right now we're walking down probably the closest name to this neighborhood will be shockweed which is kind of like a indian-ish part of the town so we got some i guess meat pie and some banana little dumplings and some banana, uh, some mango juice. And right now we're in a hunt for a burger. There was a beef burger out there that looked pretty promising. So that's what I'm gonna get. And then we're gonna find somewhere real cool and exotic, some like colorful corner and do some people watching while we eat. 
I like people watching, especially here. There's all kinds of interesting stuff. Overall, this ended up being a really nice afternoon, despite the rain. Another really cool adventure in Kuala Lumpur is visiting the Little India neighborhood, the biggest Little India in the world. You should be able to find the link for that right here. The best part about visiting Little India was how many different things there were to do, from ancient towers, Buddhist and Hindu temples, to exotic foods and local Indian bazaars, and many other surprises. We had such a good time there. Is it spicy? Very flavorful, but it's not spicy. Cool. So we finally found a really cool place to stop, sit down, and, and eat. We're in the middle of this, I don't know, wide Asian nice street, and there's shops and businesses and restaurants everywhere, and a lot of really cool people walking by. So we're gonna eat here. It's getting dark. It's around 7:30 right now, and then we're just gonna head. Our next stop is the National Museum of Malaysia. But before we go inside, if you're new to our channel, don't forget to subscribe and like this video. And if you know anyone that could benefit from watching this video also, make sure you share it with them. The Malay name for this wonderful museum is Museum Negara. Completed in 1963, this three-story building is ideally positioned next to the Perdana Lake Gardens and provides insight into the Malaysian culture and history. As we arrive, the first thing we notice are the two beautiful murals flanking the main entrance made of glass mosaic tiles brought all the way from Italy. The artist that took Shaun Lai Tong created the murals in 1962 to showcase Malaysia's culture and history. The East mural is titled Episodes from Malayan History, while the West one is titled Malayan Crafts and Craftsmen. The National Museum is in a very, very convenient location. Right now we're about a three minute walk from KL Central, one of the biggest train stations or metro stations in Kuala Lumpur. Right behind me, you can see the big Warson Tower and literally behind this museum are the Lake Gardens. And over there is the National Planetarium, which is one of the museums on this list. We'll be going there soon. And about a five minute walk from that is the National Mosque of Malaysia, Masjid Negara, a beautiful mosque. Recently, we visited there and made a really cool video. You should be able to find the link for that right up here. Beautiful mosque. We had a really good time. If you like culture, religion, and history, that's a video that you need to watch. Link for that right up here. But let's go inside. Entering the museum lobby, we find ourselves inside a wide open space with a majestic staircase that dominates the back wall, splitting the lobby into two both sides leading up to the upper galleries. This beautiful design is called a rangoli. Rangolis, also known as kogans, are thought to bring prosperity to homes and buildings. Rangoli is an art form that originates from India, in which patterns are created on the floor you see materials such as powder limestone, dried rice flour, colored sands, flower petals, and colored rocks. It is a common practice in many Hindu households. However, making it is mostly reserved for festivals and other important celebrations as making it is very time consuming.
There are several galleries in the museum, each featuring a different subject, such as local arts and crafts, economic activity, weaponry, and money, as well as the history and culture of Malaysia. On the ground floor, exhibits trace the development of the Malay Peninsula starting at the Stone Age and going through the Bronze and Iron Ages into the Hindu and Buddhist kingdoms and eventually the Muslim Sultanate of Malacca. This gallery offers an overview of the kingdoms and sultanates established within what is known as the Malay Archipelago between the 2nd and the 16th century. The late Kingdom of Malacca traces its early history to the year 1400 when a settlement was first established by Parameswara, a Palembang prince. An important turning point in the history of Malacca is the conversion of its second ruler, Sultan Megati Skandar Shah, to Islam, which further bolstered its position in the region as a distinctive economic superpower. Malacca's reputation as an international port was a key contributing factor to its growth and diversity. It experienced the coming together of peoples of different backgrounds from across the Malay archipelago and beyond, namely Siam, Burma, China, India, Persia, Arabia, and many more. There were those who came only for trade, and there were those who chose to settle and intermingle with the locals birthing new communities. No less than 84 languages were spoken in the port city during its peak, with Malay being the lingua franca. Some of the arts and cultural items used by these communities are displayed in this gallery, such as ceramics, jewelry, and traditional wear. The first gallery on the top floor explores the history of Malaysia from the 1500s to the 1940s. At the turn of the 16th century, the Kingdom of Malacca was living through a golden era due to its strategic location at the Straits of Malacca. Through an effective administration, a close relationship with China and a monopoly over the spice trade, Coupled with the coming of Islam, Malacca became a wealthy, prosperous, and thriving state. Unfortunately, this success also made Malacca into a target that attracted the interest of foreign powers, leading to the fall of Malacca to the Portuguese in 1511. This was the beginning of the colonial era in Malaysia, an era that would last more than 440 years and that would impact many changes in the political, social, and economic development of Malaysia. Different exhibits take us through the colonial years. First came the Portuguese who ruled for 130 years from 1511 to 1641. Then, the Dutch rule lasted 183 years from 1641 to 1824. And finally, the British occupation lasted 133 years. It was briefly interrupted by the Japanese occupation of Malaysia during the Second World War, and it ended in 1957, when Malaysia finally became an independent country. The gallery on the opposite side of the upper floor explores the local Malayan history from the end of the Second World War right up to the present time. The Japanese invasion of Malaysia in 1941 discredited the British ability to protect the local people and this contributed to the rise of Malayan nationalism and the hunger for independence which became an aspiration. The return of the British to post-war Malaysia was riddled with public opposition leading up to independence finally in 1957. Some of Malaysia's national symbols displayed here include the national anthem, the flag, the coat of arms, and the national flower. The flag of Malaysia, known as the Stripes of Glory, has a total of 14 equal red and white stripes 
that symbolize the 13 states and the federal territory. The crescent symbolizes Islam as the official religion, while the royal color, yellow, is indicated on both the crescent and the star. This gallery illustrates the fact that Malaysia is a unique nation where colors, flavors, sounds, and sights all come together as one. A country where people of various ethnic groups have been able to live in peace and harmony since its independence in 1957. The National Museum is open every day from 9 to 5 and tickets are very affordable at just 5 ringgit per person. The Islamic Arts Museum of Malaysia. Built in 1998, this is Southeast Asia's largest museum of Islamic art, housing over 7,000 artifacts and relics. The museum building itself is a marvel, with four great domes carved and gilded by artisans brought in from the Middle East. The main lobby has an impressive, beautifully decorated, inverted white dome with a crisp white interior and marble floors. As we explore around the museum, we find another three domes, a soft blue, a pink, and a beige color one. All carved with intricate patterns and enclosed by glass walls that let in the natural light. Distributed over two floors, we find 12 permanent galleries covering different aspects of artistic expression, such as architecture, ceramics, metalwork, textiles, and jewelry. The ones that stood out to me were the Malay World Gallery. The exhibits in this gallery showcase the Islamic influence on the Malay world, with examples of textiles, manuscripts, and clothes showing the influence of the Islamic faith in the lives of the Malay people. One of the highlights of this room is the display of keres or daggers that belong to Sultan Abdul Halil featuring designs from various parts of the Malay country. The Jewelry Gallery Exhibits here include Indian jewelry, Turkoman jewelry, and jewelry from the Fatimid era. The Damascus Room Here we find one of the highlights of the museum, the magnificent door curtain of the Kaaba. Kiswa, referred to as the House of God, along with manuscripts dating back to the 9th and 10th century AD. And particularly impressive were the scale models of the mosques from around the world. These models are not meant to be artwork, they mainly serve and educational purpose. But there was one exhibition in particular that took my breath away, and that was the exhibition called Orientalist Paintings, Mirror or Mirage. What a treat. This amazing exhibition ran from June to October and contained one of the world's largest collections of Orientalist paintings displayed over two galleries. An Orientalist painting is more than a work of art. It is also an insight into people and places from a different era. The paintings are mostly from the 19th century, a time when it became possible for European and Asian artists to travel to the Orient, as the Middle East and East and North Africa were called at the time. Flawlessly painted and carefully composed, they offer us a glimpse of places that mostly still exist. 
they depict known locations, either mentioned in the painting's title or easily identifiable. In many cases, collectors would pay a premium when they could see the exact location of the painting. The collection is about what the artists saw and encountered on their daily lives. It is about their reactions to the Islamic world. As we walked around and marveled at the skills on display, I couldn't check off the idea of these paintings being the earliest version of a travel blog. I felt a strong kinship with this intrepid man who traveled to faraway lands to explore and document what they saw. We're visiting the Islam National Museum right now and we we're about to leave and it started, I don't know if you can see behind it, it started pouring down. <laughs> so now we're stuck here for a little bit, but that's okay because we get to see it all over again. Which I'm excited about and the show is not. <laughs> there is a small outside terrace on the second floor that offers great views of the National Mosque across the street and the city behind. Unfortunately, by the time we got outside, it had already started to rain. The National Planetarium. Completed in 1993, the National Planetarium, which in Malay is the Planetarium Nagara, is a blue dome structure situated on top of a hill within the Lake Gardens in Kuala Lumpur that offers visitors a glimpse into the mysteries of space and the wonders of the universe. Visitors can explore a range of exhibits as they walk through the museum with state-of-the-art projection systems and interactive displays offering an immersive experience that is both educational and entertaining. We had a lot of fun exploring and interacting with the different displays. So they have this, uh, I guess, virtual reality space pod slash roller coaster, <laughs> roller coaster here. Now you have to pay for that. It looks really cool. It looks really cool. But the rest of the museum, like walking around, is completely free, which is really cool. Let's go explore. Some of the different exhibits include the anti-gravity room which simulates a room in space. It's not really anti-gravity in the sense that you would float around, rather an optical illusion that alters your balance. Feels Whoa. weird. <laughs> Whoa. Like there's still gravity, but you feel so weird. <laughs> yeah, it is a weird feeling, man. Imagine this being your life, like not being able to. <laughs> and if it's a light, I don't know. Because the room is tilted, our brains are unable to process whether it is our body or the room that is supposed to be standing up straight, creating a sense of imbalance. The deep blue lights also add to the illusion. We felt very disoriented inside, but I guess that's the whole point. The sensory room, where visitors can put their senses of smell, hearing and sight to the test. Gunpowder, sulfur, ammonia, raspberry, and water. That smells like nothing. 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 Okay, I spelled bubble gum on that one. And nothing. You try. I smell something. What do you smell on that one? It smells like salt. Salt? <laughs> supposed to be sulfur, so close enough. No. Yeah, I smell gum as well. This smells like rain. This is the sun of the sun. 
the sound of the sun. Yeah, I didn't know the sun made noises. <laughs> Do you see anything cool? It makes it, it makes it 3D. It's like the old school 3D glasses. 3D glasses from the movie theaters. That's Here. the door. Yeah, you would have to go through there. As we walk into the second hall, we have the opportunity to experience the life of an astronaut. From the lab room of a spaceship to using an outer space bed and trying to stack blocks while wearing enormous space gloves. In the main showroom, we find different exhibits related to space and science. This is the Ariane 4 space engine, which is one of the engines used to launch the MISET-1 satellite, which was Malaysia's first satellite into space. In this room, you also find interactive replicas of the first rovers sent to Mars, as well as a sample of an astronaut spacesuit. The entrance or lobby hall has a wide range of interactive setups where visitors can learn about the different celestial bodies in our solar system. One of the big highlights of the planetarium is the Dome Theater, which features stunning 360 degree projections of the night nice sky and other astronomical phenomena. This is also a paid experience, although very affordable at only 12 ringgit or $3 per person. Here we can see the Campo del Cielo meteorite weighing 10 kilograms which was discovered in Argentina in the year 1576. This is also where we find the space pod, another major highlight of the planetarium. However, this is a paid experience with a cost of 24 ringgit or $6. The planetarium is open daily from 9 to 4.30, but closed on Mondays, and entrance is free. We are now just walking out of the planetarium, and it's super hot out here, and very, very, <laughs> very bright. bright. But what an incredible experience. I uh, think this is my favorite museum of all. Yeah? Because most of the time when you go to a planetarium, you just go in, there's a theater. But this one like had stuff for you to do. Yeah, there's a lot of cool. a lot of really cool stuff. You do have the theater where they do the shows. We didn't do a show uh, because we just enjoyed playing and, and, and looking at <laughs> Being everything. A Being a kid in the <laughs> museum. They also have the 3D VR um, space like, pod. Yes, thing. roller coaster thing that looks really cool. But other than that, the actual free gallery and exhibit was super cool. Now I'm still thinking that in my opinion the best one is the Islamic Arts Museum. That's number one for me. <laughs> this would be number two in Kuala Lumpur. You, you like this one the best? Yeah, this is my favorite. Okay. And the entrance is beautiful. It's so pretty walking up the stairs and seeing this. It's really, really pretty. But hey, if museums and history are not your cup of tea, we've got you covered. Recently we made a really cool video reviewing Kuala Lumpur and we talk about all the other things that you can do in this amazing city so you should be able to find the link for that right here check it out and find out what else is there to do in this crazy amazing city in any case i'm glad you enjoyed this video and i'll see you next time